is and what he has done, but it goes further. It also gives us the model and the power for how we're to live. My prayer for us as we go through this passage this morning is that this word would not simply inform our theology, but it would inform our methodology as well. Show us something fresh about Christ and his calling upon our lives that when we leave in a bit, we will be different than when we came through those doors a moment ago. Bless the preaching and the hearing of your word. We ask it for Christ's sake. Amen. How would you respond if someone asked you a question, what does it mean to be a Christian? Think about that for a minute. What does it mean to be a Christian? Now, most of us would say, well, you need to ask Jesus into your heart. You need to go to church. You need to read your Bible. You need to pray. You need to be a witness, live a holy life. And all those things are good. They're right. But they all tend to focus on me and us and what we should be doing. When Jesus was asked a similar question, his answers were radically different. He said, you need to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. He said, you need to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. In Jesus' mind, a Christian is someone who loves God and loves others sacrificially and above themselves with all they have. Now, if we're honest, we got a problem. And the problem is since the moment we're born, we're all kind of given this sense that the world revolves around us. And what kind of begins as a survival instinct quickly becomes a fallen worldview for us. And this drive is so strong, so universal, that the community that doesn't get a handle on self-restraint will self-destruct. But it's for this selfish nature that Christ came. It's this for this reason he came. He took on flesh to not only deal with our sin, but he came to model and empower his way, the kingdom way of life. Because God took on flesh and he lived and he died for us, we are called to an incarnational life. Now, I want to explore that truth in this passage from four perspectives this morning. I want us to see the motive the marks, the mindset, and the model of incarnational living. Let's think about those for a bit. First, the motive for incarnational living. Now, Paul, here in verse 1, he asks a rhetorical question that really gets to the heart of what incarnational living is all about. He's asking, basically in my paraphrase, does having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ encourage you in any way? Does his love comfort you at any time? Does his Holy Spirit ever bring you into fellowship with God? Have you ever received any tenderness or compassion because of his grace? Well, of course they had. And the simple idea is that for the Philippian Christians and for us by extension, we have all received these by God's grace. And so the simple motive for incarnational living is praise and thanksgiving. Now, so the question that comes up as I think about that, and you should think about it, is what is it that motivates my life? I need to ask that question. What motivates my life? I mean, for a lot of us, it's money, it's power, pleasure, possessions. There's a whole other side that's motivated by duty or guilt or habit or tradition. But the problem with all of those things is they're all outside motivations and nothing will motivate an incarnational life from the outside. Incarnational living is inside out living. It's God working in our heart, showing us who he is, reminding us of what he has done for us. That embraced by faith produces praise. It produces thanksgiving that's expressed in how we live. So incarnational living is motivated from the inside out. But what God has already done in our hearts, that we already own that by faith. But what does that look like? I mean, what are the marks of an incarnational life? For Paul, it's two things. The first thing is joy. Now remember, Paul's writing this letter from a prison cell. 
And yet Paul's joy, the way he lived people, the way he lived with people, the way he loved people, the way he shared with people, the way he wrote, so compelling, so effective was Paul's joy. People were drawn to him. But the second thing Paul says is a mark of incarnational living is unity. This, this commitment to solidarity among the church in how they thought about one another, how they loved one another, how they sought the leading of the Holy Spirit together, how they were all striving together as a person for the same purpose, the same goal. But there's something interesting here. In some sense, Paul's joy was not complete, and he was looking to the Philippians for an answer to that, for a completion of that. Now, what was that about? Well, as best I can understand that, in some mysterious way, joy and unity are codependent. Without unity, joy will be complete, and without joy, unity can't happen. And so as I was thinking about that for my own life this week, I was thinking that a simple application for us would be that if we're lacking joy in our lives, at least one place we ought to be looking is where there's disunity. Where is my fellowship with another Christian broken in some sense? Because the bottom line here is joy and unity are clear marks of an, in, of an incarnational life. I kind of like to think of them kind of like life tattoos. Now, y'all know tattoos are huge in our day, right? Everywhere you go, it's on TV with celebrities, athletes, the regular people, tattoos are huge around us. Now, you need to know something right off the bat. I don't have a problem with tattoos. Some of the people I love the most in this world have tattoos. And I don't have a problem because I think God is more concerned about the inside than he is the outside. Now, I'm not here to advocate for tattoos this morning. If you want to have a conversation with me about tattoos, I'm going to be right out there after church. I'll be happy to speak to you about it. I want to use a tattoo as an illustration this morning because tattoos say something very important about the person that has them. They mark that person for life. I've seen a lot of tattoos. I've seen some, and I was thinking, man, you are going to regret you ever did that. And I've seen others so compelling, so distinctive, I think so beautiful, that I, I couldn't stop staring at them. And in fact, talking with people about their tattoos is a great way to begin a conversation. I mean, I've learned so much about people by just talking to them about their tattoos. Now, again, I'm not advocating for tattoos this morning. I'm simply saying joy and unity should mark a Christian's life in the very same way a tattoo marks a person's body. It should say something very distinctive about me that when people see it, they're compelled to ask. What is it, brother, that marks you the way you are? Now, it shouldn't surprise any of you that I'm a country music fan. I know that might shock some of you. Shouldn't. Jason Aldean's tune called Tattoos on This Town, I think, really gets to the heart of what I'm trying to say here. He's talking about the town he grew up in, and he says, It sure left its mark on us. We sure left our mark on it. We let the world know we were here with everything we did. We laid a lot of memories down, like tattoos on this town. Every single one of us, brothers and sisters, are leaving a mark on the town that we live in, in the places that we inhabit. The question is, what does that mark say about us? And even more important, what does it say about Christ? All too often, though, marks of joy and unity are absent in our lives, and they're absent in the churches. And that always hinders the advancement of the gospel in and through our lives. And Paul addresses this as an attitude problem, a mindset issue. And he points out two negative mindsets that are destructive along these lines. And the first one is selfish ambition, this pushing my agenda, trying to advance myself, my ideas. I've been guilty of that so many times. The second one is vain conceit. 
this idea of thinking too highly of myself, that I'm smarter than all the rest. My way is the best way, the right way. I think the most damning evidence, vain conceit, is this idea of never being able to admit you're wrong, never being able to see the sin in your own life. But Paul contrasts that with a better way, Christ's way. He contrasts that with the way of humility. This idea of thinking more of ourselves, of, of others than we do ourselves. Thinking more of their ways above my own. Being quick to admit when we're at fault. Being quick to seek forgiveness. As I see it and as I read this and as I look at Christ's life, humility is the foundational mindset of an incarnational life. Now, since every one of us are masters of manipulation and justification for selfish living, Paul says this in verse 5 that leaves us absolutely no wiggle room here. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. I remember when I was a kid... My parents used to say to me, Bill, you need an attitude adjustment. I hated that, which was pretty compelling evidence that they were right. <laughs> I swore I would never say that to my children. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Another place I failed my kids. The point is, we all need an attitude adjustment. A different mindset if we're going to embrace the mind of Jesus and if we're going to live incarnationally. Now, how does that work? Well, I know humility begins with prayer. It begins by asking the Lord to expose the selfish ambition, the vain conceit that's in my life and in my heart. And then it's asking him to give me a spirit of repentance, a willing spirit to change and do something different. So humility is first a mindset. It's an attitude that's followed by an action. I love C.S. Lewis's mere Christianity. I know that has spoke to many people's hearts, been used instrumentally in the faith of a lot of people. I think he gives us some really good help in that book of what this might look like. He says this, it helps to pretend to be Jesus, just as a child pretends to be a soldier or a shopkeeper. In the same way a child's imaginary games helps him develop skills that will later be useful, so pretending to be Jesus guides the believer towards spiritual maturity. And I love this line. The minute we realize we're dressing up like Christ, we discover ways in which our pretense could become reality. I think that's Lewis's very creative take on Christ's words in Matthew 18 when he said, unless you change and become like a little child, you really can't be a part of the kingdom. On a very practical level, what if I made up my mind today that I'm going to think more highly of you than I think of me? And what if you made up your mind today that you were going to think more highly of me than you? And then what if we began to actually treat one another that way? I mean, I think the fruit of that would be amazing. I think a new community would spring up here and take life, a community where everyone is looked up to and no one is looked down upon. I think that's the community that Christ longs for. I know it's the community he lived and died for and rose again. And I know it is the community that will be compelling to the world around us. I believe that. And we see a picture of the king of that community in verses 6 to 8 where we have the ultimate model of incarnational life. In this passage, we see very clearly who Christ is and what he's done. In his nature, that is his essence, his unchanging being, he is fully God. He always has been and always will be. And yet... He made himself nothing. Literally, he emptied himself. Not of his divine nature, of his divine prerogatives, his divine rights. He emptied himself. 
And he took on flesh as one of us. And he didn't come as a king or a prince. He came as a servant. Literally, he came as a slave. And we see the extent of that in verse 8. In his flesh, he endured the most shameful death of all. He died as a common criminal on a cross. He showed us there that there is absolutely no limit to what God will do to save his people, to display his love and his saving power. And inherent in his model, we see his mission to seek and to save the lost. All of that, the fact of his divinity, the fact of his humble humanity, all of that is a great display of the power of God. That's important for us to grasp. Because it's very easy for Christians to primarily think of God's power as being expressed in His divine majesty and glory. And while it is, it is maybe more so expressed in His humanity and His servant suffering. Think about it. God's power is made what? Perfect in weakness. And the greatest evidence of that? The cross. As it was for Christ, so too will it be for us. Now, we saw this yesterday at our presbytery meeting in an extraordinary way. Some of you may know David Wayne. David Wayne's the pastor out at Grace Point Press, out in Severn. David is losing his battle with cancer. David cannot stand in the pulpit anymore and preach. He has to sit. And David can get one, maybe two words out of his mouth before he has to gasp for breath. He is as weak as a human being can be and still be up and moving around. David preached one of the most powerful sermons I've ever heard in my life yesterday. Sitting, broken, gasping for breath, proclaiming the power of God, God's ability to love those who are broken and weak, God's ability to inject them with power that they had never known about in their lives when they were strong. It was extraordinary. I was weeping. I could not stop. It was such an extraordinary sermon. God's power made perfect in weakness. And because of Christ's weakness, because of his humility, he has become the ultimate model of exaltation. Where Christ has been exalted above everything, he's been given the name that's above every other name, that every knee will bow and every tongue confess in heaven and on earth and in hell will bow down before this Lord and proclaim Him as Lord. All because the power manifested in His weakness. Now there's no question here, that's a clear statement of Christ's divinity. It's also a clear testament to the end times. Paul's looking forward to that end times when every knee will bow and every tongue confess. Paul's not speaking about universal salvation here. The fact is, many people in this life will not humble themselves before Christ. That's a choice you can make. God will allow you to make that choice. But this life, not all there is. Jesus will return, and when he does, we'll all stand before him. We will all give an account of our lives. Some of it will do it with great joy because of Christ. He has taken our sin. Amen. And others of us, those of us who have rejected Christ in this life, you're going to bow down. You are going to know He is Lord that day. And you will confess Him as Lord, but you'll do it with great despair and great regret because it's going to be too late. You see, in Christ, we see the ultimate model that those who humble themselves will be exalted. And if it's true for Christ, it'll be true for you in Christ. We see the other side of that coin, too. Those who refuse to humble themselves, they will be humbled. Jesus said, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. But it it need not be that way. It simply doesn't have to be that way. Knowing who Jesus is, knowing what he's done for you and for me, what possible reason, what logical reason could you continue on in rejection of him? I mean, I guess you can gamble that the Bible's a bunch of lies, it's full of myths and stories, but, I mean, the stakes are incredibly high. 
You're wagering your eternity here. If you're here this morning worshiping with us here in the sanctuary or if you're with us online and you don't know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I'm so glad you're with us. It's a joy to welcome you in his name. My prayer for you this morning is that he would give you what one of my friends called the gift of desperation to cry out for him, to speak to a Christian you know, somebody you know who loves the Lord and lives that life incarnationally. Speak to me or Pastor Glenn here in the sanctuary. Or if you're online, speak to a friend you know. Open your heart and at least give Christ a chance. Those of us who know him who have done that can testify. He will meet you where you are. He loves you enough to take you like you are, but he loves you too much to leave you like you are. He's in the business of changing us. If you're here this morning, you're a Christian. I'm glad you're here too. And I... I'm not telling you anything about Jesus you don't already know. But familiarity often breeds complacency. We know that's true. It's so easy to look at the model of Christ's incarnational life and kind of admire it from a distance. But I want you to remember something. To confess and bow is a word and deed thing. And it's not just an end times thing. It's a thing for today. God wants us to praise His Son. He wants us to be in awe of Jesus Christ, proclaim Him as Lord. But He also wants us to go into the world and imitate His Son that we proclaim Lord. Because His Lordship is not just a word thing, it's a deed thing for us. Now you and I both know on our own we're not going to be able to do that. You're not going to wake up tomorrow morning and say, you know what, I think I'm going to live incarnationally today. But we don't have to. Pastor Glenn is going to preach on this passage next week. For it is God who works in you to will and to act. He has promised you His power working from the inside out. And not only that, the Scriptures tell us in Christ, we have Christ's mind. So we got the promised power of God working from the inside out. We got the mind of Christ shaping that work. If you're in Christ, you own those things. They already belong to you. But we have to choose to use them. To have something and not use it, really a waste, isn't it? Y'all know know I love vehicles. I can't preach a sermon without getting one of my projects into the sermon. I love working on cars and bikes and things. I really do. I love looking at them, tinkering with them. I love driving them. I've seen a lot of really, really cool cars and bikes in my life. I've been around a lot of them, things that I just are staggered by. I've known a lot of people that own really amazing vehicles. But there's a category of cars and bikes that we call trailer queens. You know what a trailer queen is? It's a car that's so nice that nobody ever takes it out of the garage. They just look at it because they're afraid they're going to tear it up or damage it somehow. So if they actually take it somewhere, they put it on a trailer and drive it there. I can't fathom that. Now, I can understand some people collecting. There are cars I'd love to collect as well, but my own personal approach is if I can't drive it and enjoy it, I don't really want the thing. Now, I realized something this week. Every mechanic worth his salt needs to have a garage with a name. My garage doesn't have a name. I started feeling the weight of that this week, but the Lord gave me a name for my garage this week based on this sermon. You know what it is? Can you guess? No trailer queen garage. (laughs) Now, I love that, and I'll tell you why I love that. I think that's a great philosophy of ministry for how we should be living as Christians. There should not be a single trailer queen amongst us. We should take what we have. We should use it. We should enjoy it. Bring it to bear because God has given it to us. We're called to use what we have. But how do we do that? I mean, what does that look like practically? Let's wind this down. Let me go back to where we started, to our call to worship. But this time I want to read the call to worship from the message. It says this, The Word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Incarnational living is embracing Christ's 
incarnational mindset, which is humility, his life, his incarnational life, which was sacrificial service, and his incarnational mission, which was to seek and save the lost. Embracing that as our own, and we do that by embodying the good news of the kingdom in the midst of the lives and relationships in the spaces we already inhabit, to the folks we already live with and play with and work with. Asking a couple simple questions. How can I be good news to them? How can I embody the kingdom in such a way they can experience that with me? Now, you and I cannot change anybody's spiritual state. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. But we can create the kind of environment that gives room for the Holy Spirit to work. And that, when they begin to see that they are needed, that they are wanted, and that they are loved, and when they see that in me, they're going to see Christ. I don't know what that's going to look like for you. I was thinking about a lot of practical applications, maybe a block party or a community service project or some kind of recreation or a picnic, maybe a Bible study or a book club. One thing I was thinking about is what might a community garden in my community look like where I invited everybody to come and be a part of that. That's something I'm praying to God about. I'm asking God to show me, to connect me with my neighbors, connect me with the people around me. I'm asking you to ask him as well. And as we become intentional in incarnational living, as Christ was intentional, I think we're going to see two things. I think we're going to see a mending of the torn social fabric that's all around us. And I think we're going to see a fresh inbreaking of the kingdom of God and his reign in this world and when we see that the incarnational has become transformational because God took on flesh and he lived and he died for us we are called to an incarnational life let's bow our heads and let's pray Father thank you for this day thank you Father you did not leave this world in its sin. You did not leave us to sort it out because we couldn't. Father, there was only one way and that was for you to take on flesh. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He came in the flesh and he lived and he died for us. And the way you engaged this world was incarnationally and that's the way you call us to engage it as well. The incarnation is more than just theology. It has to shape and change the way we live or we really don't believe that theology we say we do. Convict our hearts, Lord, where there is selfishness and conceit. Stir up in us a mindset of humility like Christ himself. Give us the same mission that Christ has to seek and save the lost and make our lives a living sacrifice that others may know. Father, take these, your words, imprint them on our hearts and then upon our lives. We ask it all in the name of Jesus, our risen Savior. Amen and amen. Let's stand together and let's sing our last song. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I move. I will follow.
the benediction this morning that we're going to have a lunch right down in the auditorium as soon as we're done this morning go straight down the hall and into the auditorium and please join us we'd love to have you I'm going to pray for our lunch and then I'll offer the benediction father thank you for this day thank you for every blessing we have the greatest of all is Christ even as he feeds us spiritually we ask that you would feed us physically thank you for those that prepared the food we would ask that this time of food and refreshment and fellowship would be a great time of community, that we would have the opportunity to practice incarnational living even down there. So, Lord, would you bless our time together. And now may you sing the glorious praises of your God through all your days. May you put no confidence in princes, nor for help on man depend. That the Lord who gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak make you run and not grow faint, make you walk and not fail, make you into a man, a woman, a boy and girl who is committed to living incarnationally. Amen. That concludes this netcast of Transforming Grace. Severna Park Evangelical Presbyterian Church is located at 110 Ritchie Highway in Pasadena, Maryland. If you have any questions about the church, please call the church office at 410-544-5013 between the hours of 8.30 a.m. and 4 p.m. Monday through Friday. For comments about this netcast, send an email to mediaministry at spepchurch.org. That's mediaministry, all one word, at spepchurch.org. Join us again next week at the same time for Transforming Grace.